in this lab, we're going to be acetylating ferrocene. Uh, now, before I get into any of the uh, compounds that we're going to be using, I want to start with our reaction setup, which I've got right here. Uh, what we're going to be doing in order to make the reaction happen is I'm going to take this whole reaction setup and swirl it in a boiling water bath. Um, however, there's a problem. The reaction is actually very sensitive to water. Um, the acetic and hydride reacts with water to become acetic acid, and that's not useful to us. So the key to making this reaction still work is this guy right here, this drying tube. This is just a bent piece of glass, and here I've got a cotton plug, a cotton plug, and in the middle, this is calcium chloride. Now, calcium chloride is a desiccant, which means that it will react with water in the air and solidify it, so that removes it from the gases coming into the reaction. And so it's perfectly fine uh, to do this over a steamy, hot water bath, and no water is going to spoil our reaction. Okay, with that said, let's start bringing in our reagents. So number one is going to be the acetic and hydride. Uh, acetic and hydride, like I said, is rather sensitive to water in the atmosphere. Um, if you leave this uncapped and you just expose it to air overnight, it's probably going to spoil the bottle. You're probably going to lose about half. One mil, and I need two mils. Okay, two mils of acetic and hydride. Now that that's in, we're going to add our catalyst, which is a strong acid, and today's choice is phosphoric acid. And I just need two drops of this. It's very concentrated, and it's also just a catalyst, so the exact amount of this doesn't matter as much. Two drops. Alright, let's swirl those together and just let them mix before I introduce the Pharisee. Now, really quickly, our Pharisee looks like this. This bright orange powder is an organometallic compound. It's got an iron sandwiched between two cyclopentyldienyl rings. Um, what that means is that it's got two aromatic systems uh, with a high buildup of negative charge. And when we introduce the negatively charged rings on the ferrocene to the positively, uh, or the positive dipoles on the carbonyls of the acetic and hydride, they can form a carbon-carbon bond and react. And that will leave us with an acetylated ferrocene. So, Ferrocene's going to go in. And I'm going to go ahead and attach my air condenser and my drying tube. Give it a quick swirl. And into heat, we're going to go. And just a gentle swirl. Now what I'm expecting to happen uh, as I swirl this in my hot water bath is I'm expecting this to darken. The ferrocene, uh, when it's diluted in solution, is yellow in color, whereas the acetyl ferrocene is a darker orange. We're going to see this a bit later uh, as we're separating by column chromatography. But for right now, I hope you can see the darkening of the 
reaction is a positive sign that this is working as intended.
So, okay. I'm going to give this a good swirl to try to agitate the stuff in here, get it kicked up into solution, and then I'm going to go ahead and filter. I'm only getting like a little dribble out, uh, and I still have actually a lot more solution to go here. Uh, this is going to take a while, and it's probably due to really fine particulates in my uh, reaction. Those fine particulates clog, uh, clog up the pores of the filter paper uh, and just make this process a little bit more painful. Um, so this is going to take a couple of pours. Ferrocene and ferrocene looks like a really nice orange mud. Uh, I'm going to continue to dry this for a few minutes. Um, we've already let it dry probably for five to ten minutes. Uh, it's been incredibly painful and long, and uh, we're going to do this a little bit more in a cut uh, so that we can start working on the uh, column chromatography setup as well. So we'll come back to that. Okay. So, we've let this dry for several more minutes on the best vacuum in the lab, and what we have now is kind of a sandy combination of acetylferrocene and ferrocene. Um, so, this is now dry enough that we can separate it by column chromatography. So, here is our column. Um, we've got a stopcock down here. This is a lure tip, which has a little uh, filter in it, very much like a uh, vacuum filtration, um, and the column where all of the alumina is going to go. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open this up and introduce my alumina, and I'm going to fill this up about two-thirds of the way. Great 
at driving out the Pharisee, which is really nonpolar, but it's not going to have much of an effect on the acetyl Pharisee, which is more polar. you guys are going to see is this line of wetness which is running down the aluminum. And that's my petroleum ether wetting it down. And when it's wetted down, uh, organic molecules can run down with it. And we should see a little drip there. Boop. Very nice. Um, so, like I said, air bubbles are the enemy here. This whole thing's wetted down with petroleum ether right now. Um, if I were to get an air bubble caught right about here, that would actually stop the flow of petroleum ether, and nothing could make it past that. The dripping would stop, my column would need some adjustments, or I'd need to try it again. Um, so, in order to prevent that, a really important, uh, thing to remember when doing a column is to never let it run dry. And what that means is that my solvent level is right here right now. I never want the solvent to run underneath the alumina layer here. I always want to keep a layer of some solvent up here because that'll keep the air out. And I'm going to wait just a few seconds. My solvent line is right here. I'm going to wait for it to get right about here before I introduce my uh, mixture of acetylferrocene and ferrocene. turned my stopcock to stop the flow uh, because I'm satisfied with this amount of petroleum ether on top to go ahead and start adding my compound. By minimizing the amount of uh, petrol petroleum ether above here, I'm going to minimize the dilution of my sample and that will give me nice tight bands of compound running down my column. Down this column. 
However, the acetyl ferrocene is so polar and it's so tightly fixed onto the alumina that the petroleum ether is not polar enough to push it down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow this to continue dripping um, for a while with petroleum ether. There's no ferrocene in this yet, so there's no use in collecting it. But once this yellow band has made it down to the bottom, I'm going to go ahead and start collecting it so that I can uh, collect my ferrocene. So my yellow has gotten down to about this point right here. Um, these drops still don't have anything in them, but just to be sure that I collect all of my ferrocene, I'm going to go ahead and start collecting this. Alright, so look at this deep yellow color that we're getting here, uh, now that all the ferrocene is starting to make its way out. Um, I'm keeping an eye on my solvent level, which is still pretty high, um, but uh, maybe you can't see it with the clamp, but we should see the color of the alumina return to white as the ferrocene is all removed from the system. Um, and once the alumina down here is starting to look white again, and the drips appear clear, uh, that's when I'll know that I've collected all the ferrocene possible.
going to be done with Petroleum Ether now. Um, I think that the color of my Illumina has returned almost completely to white. Um, I'm going to start adding Diethyl Ether instead, uh, because not only is this going to start pushing down the acetyl ferrocene, it's also going to remove the very last of the ferrocene from the system as well. And I'm going to have a little bit of petroleum ether, diethyl ether mixing, and that's okay. This is almost entirely diethyl ether at this point. So it's going to take a matter of minutes, at least, uh, for the acetylferrocene to come down. So it's actually completely fine to keep collecting the last little remnants of ferrocene here uh, as it gets pushed out of the system. Um, I just need to be careful to switch to my acetylferrocene collection flask uh, as this orange band starts reaching the bottom. Okay, now I think is a good time to go ahead and switch. And these drops running through are almost completely clear, but the orange band is almost about to come out. So now would be a good time to address this black stuff hanging out up here at the top. What is it? It is diacetyl ferrocene for the most part, um, which could be referred to as just polar tars uh, in this type of separation. Um, so a single acetyl group makes the acetyl ferrocene slightly polar, uh, and so we need to use diethyl ether to remove it and get it pushed through the column. Um, diacetyl ferrocene is more polar. More polar, in fact, so that uh, diethyl ether is not dissolving it very well, and this stuff is not going to move through this polar alumina very quickly at all. Um, for the purposes of this lab, we're not using any solvents that could really remove this from the system, and it's not a product that we are trying to collect anyway. Um, so we're just going to leave it to hang out at the top. Now when we're using a uh, more polar eluent, uh, or solvent, uh, the product is going to come out a lot faster, so I'm going to use less of it. In order to isolate the ferrocene and acetylferrocene, I will need to remove these volatile solvents by airstream, which can take a while, so it's practically a lot easier if I can minimize the amount of solvent. Okay, I feel comfortable stopping now. Um, the drops coming out of the column at this time are almost completely clear. Uh, so I've collected nearly all the acetylferrocene that I can. Um, uh, now, with the sped up time, uh, 
from the time that I went it down the column, this has been going for about 45 minutes. Uh, just to give you guys a reference of how long that took. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, let's go ahead and just collect the rest of the solvent as waste. And I will pour this into an appropriate organic waste container later on. Um, so, the next thing that I'm going to do, which is probably also going to require a little bit of speeding up, is I'm going to dry these solvents off of the acetylferrocene and ferrocene using an airstream. Uh, just to give you guys a reference of the colors, uh, look at this darker acetylferrocene compared to the much lighter ferrocene. Uh, I think this column worked really, really well. Uh, these are exactly the colors I would expect. And uh, I'm going to take melting points of both of these to see exactly how pure I got them. So, this is what it looks like to remove a solvent by Airstream. Um, I have a little air hose here, which I'm pinching just like a garden hose to get a little bit more pressure. And I'm just blowing air across the solvent. And it's actually really important that I hold the solvent in my hands here because as it evaporates, the solvent gets really, really cold, which stops it from evaporating. So in order to continue effectively evaporating the solvent, I need to warm it up with my hand. I'm also rotating it, kind of like how a rotovap works. Uh, this just maximizes the surface area of solvent that I'm removing at any given time. So check that out. See how that solid is being deposited on the walls of the container? Um, I'm just gonna continue doing this. It's gonna keep depositing solid uh, until all the solvent's gone. This is what my dried product looks like. It's kind of cool and wavy looking. Um, but you can see it still has that dark orange color that we would expect of acetyl ferrocene. Um, I'm going to collect this just by scraping it off of the sides of this container. Uh, I also weighed this container earlier so that I could get a mass of the container plus the solid. That's the easiest way to find a really accurate mass of what I received. Uh, so I will send uh, the melting point and mass to you guys along with this video. Uh, but first, I need to do that exact same process again with this ferrocene that had about twice as much solvent, so this is going to take a while.